Hey, Kathy, welcome to Ordinary Moments Create Extraordinary Results. Excited to have you here because I know that your story is really different and unique, just like every single school leader story on the planet. And this series is really about bringing light to the real struggle and what really happens when we try to create extraordinary results. And it's also so much about learning to appreciate the ordinary moments. So many times we chase extraordinary and we forget that the ordinary moment is really in seeing that beautiful child smile, connecting in that conversation with the teacher. So thanks for joining me here today. Happy to have you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's dive in to talk a little bit about some of the systems that you've put in place to sustain excellence. But before we dive into the systems, I really want to hear what is your definition of excellence now? Um, kind of different from when it was when we first started working together. So for me, excellence is getting better each and every day. Not always each and every moment, because sometimes we slip, but to make tomorrow better than yesterday, to do better, you know, tomorrow. When we first met, I remember we were in conversation in Facebook Messenger, and one of the first things you had told me is your definition of success was really about growth and expansion and accumulation and getting bigger and bigger. And as we started to work together, your definition of success really changed. And I'd love for you to share why why your definition of success has evolved. For me, um, definition of success is uh, having a program that um, not only that I'm proud of, but that um, my my teachers, my admin, my parents, and my children are are proud of. Why does it no longer mean more locations? And more locations isn't wrong. For those of you that are listening to this that are on the path of growth and expansion and acquisition, that's not wrong. I think what's really important to recognize is the self-awareness of what's right for you. And why was that right for you, Kathy? Uh, before, I thought that um, to be a successful owner meant that you had multiple locations. And that's what that meant to be successful. But I found through being in my business every single day to help through the world of COVID at that time, I found that really what fuels my fire is being with the families, being with the teachers and uh, building those relationships. And I just found that for me, I can't have that close relationship, that close bond with them if I have four and five locations. So for me, it just meant that I, I needed you know, one location that, uh, that I could really have those, those bonds and those relationships with. I love that. When we look at success, again, you know, because there's so many different ways to look at it, right? And you, and you just explained your definition and different people have theirs. But I think what we struggle with zeroing in on is how do we really attain that level of success? How do we really get there and stay there, but then consistently be in the pursuit of something that's bigger and greater than ourselves? You see, when when success is defined by a certain milestone of like, when I have this amount of locations or when I have X amount of money, then what happens when we get there? What's mm -hmm. next? I think the ordinary moments when we can embrace those and we, we can embrace what failure really means and why that's such an, a pivotal part of the journey, we start to become a lot happier. We start mm -hmm. to become more confident. We start to trust our decision making more and we start to fall in love with the process. One of the first things we teach in schools of excellence is the gratitude matrix. And I know this has been a system and a process that you've really embraced in your company. I would love for you to share just how it works for you and, and some of the stories around why that is such an important system for your organization. So even as early as last year, um, our turnover was wretched. I mean, Let's it was tell numbers. T tell us, oh, tell us. Oh, we bad. Oh, bad. Real raw here. Real raw. So I'm, I'm talking about, and, and, you know, it's terrible that there's so much shame behind this because yeah. we don't know what we don't know. And I mean, I'm talking like we have 14 employees and I'm sent and I'm printing out 50 
W-2s. Okay. I mean, let's be real. Wow. You know, it was wow. ugly. Okay. It was really, really ugly. And, you know, and, and we kept, we kept trying to make, to make it work, but uh, it just wasn't working. You know, we'd have somebody let's come in and they'd go out. I, I really want to unpack this here. Cause again, this is the real and the raw and the yeah. imperfect. So <laughs> 14 employees, 50 W-2s. Let's, can we dig deeper? Can you, can you come with me? I'm going to, I'm going to hold you. We're going to do this together. What does that mean? What does that look like as an owner? Talk to me about that. It it looks like failure. Mm. It looks like failure. It's hard. It's so hard because you you get them in and you get excited about them and and you know and and I'm one that I like to coach them and you know and I just I felt like I was failing day after day you know but I had this dream that you know this is going to be a great program I just don't know how to make it work and then they go to lunch and they don't come back. <laughs> Or they, or, you know, or, or you're expecting them to walk through the door at eight 30 and then they don't come, you know? Um, and so then there's this d- defeat. Ah, okay. What now? You know? And, and I think the hardest thing was looking at myself and saying, what part of this do I own? And that's, that's the big, ugly of it, but it's, it's really where it starts to turn around is when you really start to look within and see what part of this do I own? What do I need to fix about me and the way I'm running this program and then going from there? And that's for me, that's when the gratitude matrix came into play. Let's unpack what gratitude looks like in your company, because, again, I think, you know, as, as anyone that follows schools of excellence for any period of time knows how much I talk about this. And yet when we start to really talk with owners, they're like, but I do this, but I do this. And, and then it still doesn't work. So I want you to explain the messiness around what gratitude looks like in your organization and how that's really shifted your retention. Let's talk about what your W2s look like now. Once for, but first tell us a little bit about your gratitude and then, and then we'll dig into that. Yes. Uh, So for us, we first did a um, love language in the workplace um, for all of ours and found that some of the things that we were doing, they don't like, they don't like public shout outs through the walkie talkie. They get embarrassed. And, and that was a real eye opener because Mm -hmm. I thought that that would be something that would, you know, make them proud, you know, and that kind of thing. And it actually was, was backfiring for Mm -hmm. us. So after we did that, we found that the majority of our teachers really like a quiet note in their, in their cubby or um, just a, you know, a quiet one, one one-on-one conversation about what we're thankful for, what they're doing in the classroom, you know, um, that a little boy, had a huge messy diaper and they took the time to completely wash him up from mm. top to bottom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the oh, time that, that takes, you know, that takes yeah. a lot of time yeah. and really acknowledging that that's, that's what they do. Um, so just taking that time out and having that small conversation uh, has really made a huge difference. Plus we, we write little notes and put them in there, in their cubby. We do um, a favorites thing when they first start. And so getting their favorite piece of candy and putting mm-hmm. it in their locker. And so things, things of that nature. Yeah. And again, it sounds so simple. And yet I find that in this pursuit of like, well, we have to do this and we have to hire and this has to happen and this needs to happen. Many times this falls to the wayside. We're like, mm-hmm. I don't have time for this. Why have you put it at such a high value set where no matter what's going on in the center, because let's face it, everyone goes through seasons of crisis. Kathy also <laughs> has the, you know, the beauty and the ugly here. Um, why don't you let go of this? Because I've seen the difference. I've seen the difference that it makes. I've seen now teachers staying longer than the three months. You know, we're, we're celebrating some, some um, year anniversaries and I've seen the difference. I've seen their face when you tell them that um, I've gotten the, the messages through our private apps of their appreciation back. I've even gotten cards myself from them. Wow. Wow. I'm not gonna lie. The first card made me cry I uh, because I just I wasn't I wasn't expecting it, and it was the same kind of gratitude. Not just thank you for all you do. It was it was more a thank you for this note. This really lifted me up today. I you know I was having a rough day. I was tired, and so it was 
it was personal as well. Let's talk about that ripple effect there for a minute. You know, many times I speak to leaders who feel like, who fills my bucket, right? Like mm -hmm. I spend so much time doing this for the teachers and doing that for the teachers and taking care of them, but nobody fills my bucket. And here you're saying, you know, they are. There's this ripple effect that comes around where they write the cards to you. Talk, talk to us about that moment when, when you know, after the first card, you know, when, when, when something else came in. How does that shift your mindset, your energy as you step into the center that day? I, I want to be there. I don't feel like stepping in the building. I have to take a deep breath and tell me, okay, I, I can do this today. It's, it's Wednesday. You know, I'm almost there. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not having that feeling instead. It's, I, I want to be there. I want to interact with them. I want to see how they're doing and how, and also how I can help them through, through their day. Even if it's just as simple as walking in their classroom and saying, what do you need? That fills me. Yeah. I think, What's important to recognize here is, again, the ordinary moments, right? The ordinary moment of getting a card where someone's telling you, thank you. Or did they just generate a million dollars for your company? No. But that ordinary moment when done again and again, and that routine when practiced again and again, lifts you up to enter from a place of generosity as opposed to obligation. Our people feel when we're coming from a place of obligation. They feel when we're coming from this place of, I need to push myself, I need to try harder. It doesn't matter how amazing your mask is or how great of an actor you are. We feel the energy. And when the owner shows up with that kind of energy, it impacts the center. And I think what's beautiful is how you've created this culture where this isn't a one-way street. This isn't just I give to you. This is a consistent circle of life. So you were talking about how you're celebrating one-year anniversaries. You're talking about how people are staying for longer. You know, how does that really impact when you look at the amount of money and time you have to spend in training and hiring and onboarding? Can you walk us through a little bit about what that looks like? Uh, again, because you're the owner, you know, you're looking at the P&L. Talk, talk <laughs> uh, so it's I mean, obviously, when you're looking at putting out that many and you're you're having that large of a turnover, yeah. you're not really able to continue to invest in in the program yeah. because you are constantly um, putting out Indeed ads and spending time doing phone interviews and then in-person interviews and, and the overtime that your yourself and your staff are working to make up for those um, lost teachers. Uh, so it, in it's, it's, it's ugly. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard, it's hard yeah. to look at and it, and it yeah. kind of make, adds to that failure of, you know, the bottom line isn't getting bigger, it's getting smaller. And then how do, how do I, how do I fix it? You yeah. know, because you can't just throw more money at it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the practice. Why, why do you think, and, and again, I know you're so deep into it, so it might be hard to kind of put yourself where you were beforehand, but I find that many owners find it really challenging to embrace the simple routine of writing gratitude, the simple routines of connecting eye to eye with people and really mm -hmm. asking why is that so challenging to do? Where, where does the resistance come in and how do you get over that? I think some of that is so many of us, uh, you're, you're in the thick of it and you're busy trying to do your everyday stuff and you've done the whole, like, I'm just going to throw everybody some candy or, you know, and, and that kind of stuff, or, you know, give them a gift card. And I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it, you know? And so you think, well, I've already done that. You know, I already, I already mm -hmm. did that. It didn't work. But when it's, when it's specific, you know, it's kind of like when somebody says your name, um, how much that means to you. It's, it's, it's the same when it comes to the gratitude of it being specific, you know, I really did see you. I really do know who you are personally and, mm -hmm. and everything else. So I think so much of it is too simple. Um, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. You know, I need this, this big grandiose thing, um, to make it work. So why would something so simple work? And I think that's exactly what the series is about. It's not extraordinary effort creates extraordinary results. It's ordinary moments 
create extraordinary mm -hmm. results. It's always the simple things. And yet we constantly chase the big things because we want big results. And mm -hmm. so our, our minds kind of think, well, if I want something so big, then it means that I have to put in something so big. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's a really counterintuitive to say, no, 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 no. It's the simple and ordinary things, the mundane, the boring, that actually create this extraordinary impact. I love how you're how you're really seeing, you know, in your W2s, on your PL, in your profit margins, how running this gratitude system and this practice has completely turned around your retention, um, which is, you know, giving you more money in the bottom line to obviously reinvest back back in the organization. I think it's also the patience to see it through. Obviously, you didn't see results right away. Where did you find the discipline to stay through with it? Because and and if you didn't tell us your road of going like this, like walk us through this again. This is like all the real we, and the imperfect. We did have you know the ups and downs of it uh, because you know when you're short staffed, you get busy and you're doing this and you're doing that. But for me, a lot of it was I done everything else. What do I have to lose? Okay. I'd, okay. I'd done so many other things, you know, I'd done this, I'd done that, you know, even though we did have some ups and downs of it and not being, you know, kind of consistent, it was really more what I, I've got to keep going because what really, what, what do I have to lose to keep, yeah. to keep trying it and yeah. seeing if it really does make a difference. I love how you share that there's the ups and the downs, because I think with anything, whether that's you know, trying to build financial wealth or trying to get more healthy or be more fit or, you know, anything, any goal that we have in life, it's never a linear process. We don't learn in a linear way. We don't process information in that way. And I think what people need to hear is like when you're in that low, right? Like when you like go up there, you try all of that and then something happens and then you, you know, shift right back down because life happened. How when you're at the bottom there, you're not doing the gratitude and you're not doing all of that stuff. What are those habits or those trigger points where you're like, I got to get back to doing that. That's why I'm down here. What are those reminders for you? It was more, how did that feel for me when somebody gave me a card? Mm. Um, and, you know, when they're, when they're working with additional children, because you're having to combine classrooms and, you know, and, and, and they're having to, have somebody come in and train them and, you know, and all that. And then they leave again. And how did that feel for me to get that card? And, mm -hmm. and it takes, it takes, it takes less than five minutes to do it, to really make somebody's day. Or, I mean, let's get real. Sometimes it makes their week. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. I think that's the beauty of the ordinary moments where we have to remember that everyone's fighting their own battle. Everyone has their own struggles. Everyone's going through something, whether that's mentally, emotionally, spiritually, like everyone's going through something. Everyone's always carrying something. Anytime that you're the person that can lift someone up, what a gift. Like just that and alone, like I always say, like the act of giving is the reward. Like just the ability to be able to do that is the reward in itself. So let's shift to delegating. Let's shift to all the things in how, why you're delegating, how you started, like let's, let's unpack a little bit about what your let's start with your organizational chart like what does that look like now who's on your leadership team and then we'll dive into um some of the messy and the imperfect things that you've done to delegate uh so it's me as as the owner and then i do have two admin they're both now directors uh one is the curriculum director the other one is the operational director um and then from there it breaks into to teachers mm -hmm. when i first met you um the, your your orchard didn't look like this it was kind of just a big messy hoopla of like to do's and tasks and things that had to get done why did you start to shift to this model where there's you and then there's two people that link arms with you what was kind of the catalyst for that first shift? So much of it was, it's just too much to do. My center is licensed for 88. And even with 88 children, there's just so much to do. And you can't, you just can't do it all. I was working uh, days and nights and weekends. It still was still going. Um, it was just, it was just too much. And I had all of these plans and these projects at the same time, I'm dealing with day-to-day -day stuff. And, and it was just, it was just too much. Uh, and so it came to when, okay, I need to start figuring out who's in charge of what, and what does that, 
what does that look like? When we build org chart, it really depends on the results that you're looking for in the organization. And it also really depends on the natural strengths and weaknesses of the leader. I think what's important for whoever's listening to this is how you design your org chart is not based on Kathy, right? Like, oh, she has that, so I should go do that also. No, 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 no. Understanding what are you good at? What are you like just in a flow, naturally great at? What do you love to do? What brings you joy every single day when you walk into the center? And then what do you need to delegate out? Because those projects drive profit and legacy within the organization. So delegating sounds really sexy. It's like, oh, she delegates everything off her plate, but it actually looks very different than that. So let's talk about the first thing that you tried to delegate and kind of what happened, what really happened. First thing I tried to delegate, um, I try to be a very organized person, but in reality, I'm just does not feel my fire. Um, so the first thing I tried to delegate was um, the files. So the okay. children's files, uh, the teacher's files, all that kind of stuff. So uh, at the time I was the director, somebody else was this. And then now my one of my directors was the assistant director. And so I delegated that out. Well, of course, she starts doing it in my world, all kind of crazy. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and it took me a while for me to realize just because she's doing it different from me doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it different. And in reality, it's actually so much better than what I could have ever come up with. She's phenomenal at organization. Um, and so actually when our licensing rep came in, she was just ooing and awing over the files and how great they were. And the, they were the most organized that she's ever seen. And that was not me that, you know, that was her. And so that was really a big eye opener to me that just because it's different doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it different. So I always find that that's kind of phase one, right? Where we're like, okay, I'm not great at organization. I got a little squirrely brain. I like all these different ideas. Um, so I'm going to delegate some, anything that has to do with organization, right? And it could be that you're listening and you're the owner and you're like, no, 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 that stays at my plate. Like I'm the organization uh, queen. So that, those are things that are sometimes very straightforward to delegate because mm -hmm. the, after we realize we can let it go, we're like, okay, you know what? She actually does it better. It's good. I don't want that on my plate. Let's talk about the stuff that we delegate that we delegate, but then we slowly take it back because we're like, no, 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 I need this still. Talk to me about that. I'm mm -hmm. completely guilty of that. Um, my, actually, uh, I think it was last week. Um, my two directors, uh, we were we were having our weekly meeting, and um, and they're looking at each other all weird. What? What are y'all? What? What's the deal? And I said, just say it. And so they said, okay, we need to have a difficult conversation with you. I'm like, okay. And I I was guilty of that. I um, I had put them in charge of the fun days. Um, the fun things that we were going to do and, you know, crazy sock day and all that kind of stuff. Well, I was at home and just got this little whim that, oh, I want to put out a survey. Well, in doing that and in doing putting out that survey, I had delegated to them and then I had taken it all back and it really bothered them. And I appreciated the fact that they had that conversation with me. And I asked them, I said, what, what really bothers you about that? And they said, well, I feel like you didn't trust us to do it. Mm -hmm. And that hurt my heart because I, I completely trust them. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have them on such a high part of the business if I didn't completely trust them. And, you know, I obviously looked right at both of them and said, I'm so sorry. I never meant to make you feel that way. Um, I do completely trust you. I just kind of squirrel brained it and, and threw it out there and I just wasn't thinking I'm completely guilty of delegating and then <laughs> bringing it back when something comes to my mind. And in reality, what I should do is communicate with them, see if, you know, if they need my help uh, and if they don't need my help, then back off and let them do their job. There's so many things here that I want to unpack. Okay. So let's get started with the first piece, the courage to have difficult conversations. Yeah. Your directors weren't born that way. I know your directors, they didn't come into the business that way. That is not an inborn skill. That is a culture and standard that you've created in the organization. The courage to have difficult conversations and not just the courage to have difficult conversations with someone who works under you, like the staff or whatever it is. They had to level up. They had to manage up and say, 
we need to have a difficult conversation with the owner who actually gives us our paycheck. Like we need to have a conversation with her. What are some of the disciplines or some of the systems, or maybe it's a specific habit? How have you slowly embedded this culture of the permission and the courage to have difficult conversations? Because what they did was a pivotal moment in the long-term profitability and sustainability of this organization. Specifically one of them um, would rather crawl under the table than to have a difficult conversation, even with a teacher. I mean, she knows she does not want to have a difficult conversation. Um, and I can't say that I blame her because when I first started, I was the exact same way. And so a lot of it with her was just pushing that, no, you, you, you've got to have this conversation because by not having the conversation, you're actually telling that person that it's an appropriate behavior. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to have the conversation. It doesn't have to be ugly. It can be mm -hmm. an extremely respectful conversation, but it mm -hmm. still has to be said. And so pushing her out of her comfort zone and having those conversations with her teachers, I'm also very open um, with my teachers as well as my directors about, you know, we, ha we have to be honest with each other. These times, you know, we're, we're all up in each other's business. And we, and so for instance, my director and I, one of them, we share an office. And so, you know, we're, we're gonna sometimes step on each other's toes and I need you to tell me. She's actually only had two difficult conversations with me, but I think she was glad that, for instance, the first one went well you know, there wasn't backlash to it. We talked mm -hmm. it out and then it was over. And so that's a big thing with me is when we, when we talk it over, then, then it's over. You can't, yeah. you can't keep bringing all this ugly up. It's just, you've had the conversation. We are going to talk it through until it's done. And then, and then it's over. So I think that first small one was kind of the, the step to having that bigger conversation about the delegating and what that felt like on their end. I think and I'm going to I'm going to share this and I'm, you might not even recognize this piece here, but I, I want all the listeners to hear this. When someone has the courage to have a difficult conversation, specifically one when it comes to delegating, right, where they shared with you, hey, you know, you you took this away from us. And when you do that, it shows me that you don't trust us. What she's saying underneath it is. I care about this organization. I'm loyal to this company. I really want to contribute. And when you do this, you rob me of the opportunity to bring my best strengths forward. And so what she's really showing you is her commitment, her loyalty through having that difficult conversation. And I say this all the time whenever I do walk-in talks and all this stuff. And I always say, what is the meta skill for leadership? The ability to have difficult conversations. The more that you have them, the deeper your relationship will be with your team. Because what happened here is you messed up because we all do. I mess up every single day, right? Welcome to the club. But what we want is we want people to have the courage to tell us, hey, you messed up. You told me you wanted to do this, but you messed up, right? Just because I'm the leader, it doesn't mean I'm going to mess not mess up. Just because I tell someone, hey, I want to delegate this to you, it doesn't mean I'm going to say, oh, by the way, can I just double check that? Like, I want the team to come back and say, you're micromanaging, back off, I got this, right? I want my people to have the courage to say that. So I love this, it's such a great example of the messiness of delegation. Like you delegated it, you took it back, but your people stepped up for you. They had your back. They're like, not letting Kathy go down this rabbit hole again, right? Um, and it's going to happen again. And you know that. Okay. And you yeah. have the courage to have a conversation again, right? Like, that's what I want people to recognize here. Just because they had the conversation with her and Kathy's like, I'm so sorry. And that doesn't mean Kathy's not going to do it again. It's going to happen in a different way, hopefully a little bit less or whatever it is. But that doesn't mean it doesn't happen again. And I think that's what's important to recognize when it comes to this stuff is it takes a long time to really develop those new practices and routines. And while we're doing it, this series is about the messiness. It's about the middle of the journey, which is so much of our life, right? Mm -hmm. What happens in the messiness? So tell me something else that you've delegated that has really contributed just to your quality of life, right? Because you have a life beyond your school. You live in Texas. I know you like to go horseback riding. I know you love to do barbecuing and just good old, good old Southern stuff. So, so tell me how delegating has 
made your life better and richer. So one thing for me is uh, my my kids are my world. We do farm animals. We do just a little bit of everything. I guess it's kind of your typical Texas. Um, the only thing is we just want more land, but we're enjoying <laughs> our neighbor's land for now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the joy of delegating for me is that I get to spend that time with my family when I wasn't delegating, I may, I may have been home, but I wasn't really home. You know, um, I was yeah. in the home office doing my thing or my mind was still running about the business and I wasn't truly present. And we all know that kids can see right through you. So they knew I wasn't present, you know, now I'm able to just completely leave the business and we can go in the camper and spend days at a state park and just hike and have fun and play, play Farkle at the, at the camp, campsite and just, you know, just all those things. But then also just the simple things of coming home and being home at three o'clock when my boys get out of school, waking them up uh, because I'm not at the facility and I can have breakfast with them. So a lot of it for me is, is just the simple everyday stuff that oh, I can now do moment. with my family. Yeah. Um, I can do that stuff with my family because I'm not trying to do everything at the center. Let's unpack these ordinary moments here for a minute. You know, Brene Brown, um, I'm a huge fan of her work. She has great, great content. Um, one of the videos that she shared, this must be like 10 years old, um, where she talks about how we chase the extraordinary, why right? we want an extraordinary life. We want a life of impact and legacy and meaning. And then when crisis hits or when there's some sort of challenge or whatever it is, what do we want? Give me those ordinary moments. Let me be home at three o'clock to greet my boys. Let me wake them up and have some jam and toast, you know, and watch the sunrise with them. All we want is those ordinary moments. Tell me like, Walk us through your heart a little bit about when you're waking your boys up and having breakfast, what do those ordinary moments mean to you when your mind isn't racing about what's happening to the center? Like, why is that so important to you? Why do you want those ordinary moments? With my daughter, um, she's she's 18 now and in, in, in college. Thankfully, she's at home in college. So we oh, still wow. have her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. but, uh, but, you know, um, I, I didn't do that with her. Mm. I didn't do that. There was a lot of the time that you know, she and the boys were getting off the school bus and I still had another two or three more hours at the center and, um, or I'd get home and then I'd, I'd still be working and I'd still be answering phone calls from my cell phone and, and all of that because I was still doing everything. And so I've seen what I've missed, uh, with, with her, um, because I was trying to do it all when I started to really see how much I was really missing. And, and it was a difficult conversation that my husband had with me. He's like, yeah, you have that. got to turn it off. You have to turn it off. And I just kept, I just kept saying, I can't turn it off. I'm the owner. I'm not supposed to turn it off. You know, I can't turn it off until we have a holiday. There's no turning it off, you know? Mm. And, and, I found that he was wrong. You can delegate it out. You can have someone else that that you trust that can do that stuff so that when you're home, you can really be home and present. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for his many difficult conversations that I did not listen to. Um, but it, it was kind of like all of a sudden it just started to click. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your experience when you came to the small mastermind event that we had here in Florida. Um, I know you haven't been to any of our kind of bigger events, but you came to this one. How is coming together with other school leaders like your people um, sit in the room for two days, content, strategy, conversation? What were some of the impacts? Because we're going on a year right now almost. You know, it's been it's been a year, which is so crazy because I still feel like, oh, so just a few months ago. Um <laughs> How has that positively impacted your organization, your company, the school? I am um, a very shy person when you first get to meet me. My friend at the time was a part of the group and I met her from um, from previous owners and uh, and she couldn't come. And so I was like, oh, no, I'm not I'm not just I'm just not going to come. 
I'm just not going to come. And, <laughs> and, and I thought, no, 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 I, I really need this. I need, I need to go. I knew one, one other lady that was going to be there, but I kind of just knew her, you know, I wouldn't say she was somebody that we talked a lot or anything like that. So I went and I kind of put on my, my big girl panties and, and went and, um, and uh, I ended up becoming kind of best friends with one of the one of the ladies that's there. And we talk all the time now. She's just really become somebody that I lean on. Um, I like to hope that she leans on me. Uh, and and just being around other people that are are in the thick of it too. You know, they've done the delegating and taking it back and delegating and taking it back. And they've also done, you know, the, the 12 hour days and um, and then the joy of the four hour days. Uh, and so it's just great to be able to talk with them. Um, I'm a crier. So I cried multiple times uh, just because you're, you're around people that they've been there, done that, and they're still doing it. Um, and so you can get ideas from them. You can get support from them. It's a community that you just can't really explain it until you're really there and you're a part of it. And once you're a part of it, you just don't want to miss it anymore you know you want to make sure that you're always there for all of those opportunities because they're they're just they change the business because they they also help fuel you i i, I just got chills again and i, I always <laughs> when we talk about events and things like that but what what i think is so interesting from what you shared here is everything that you loved about the event was about the people right the relationships the new friendships that were formed and how it's deepened your life and i always say it's like that ordinary moment when you're sitting on the steps and you know drinking that um you know cup of coffee together or orange juice in hand or whatever it is is like that is what forges that connection and when we don't feel alone and when we know we have community to lean on that's where the impact is and like you were saying you can't explain it until you kind of been there but I love that what you're saying is you didn't talk anything about like the content or the speakers or whatever it is like those are all like second those are bonuses it's like okay that'd be nice but what you're really looking for is the relationships is those moments of connection um and deepening that when you think of community before you had community and you're kind of friendships that you have right now that you lean on why do you think you and then some other people avoid coming right like you were afraid to come right your friend who was supposed to come like it was a lot of complications and covid stuff and she wasn't able to make it why were you telling yourself the story of oh, i can't go i can't go some of that's because i'm shy um, and so it's really one, right? stepping I'm out. Sure. <laughs> well, once, you, once you get to know me, I'm not shy at all. <laughs> uh, but, she could stop talking. <laughs> uh, but so much of it is, well, you know, I don't know anybody there or, you know, there's so much to still do at the center. I can't get away. And, you know, it, even if it's just a few days, you, you can get away. Um, you can do it. And really it's for the better of your teachers and the business and yourself to get away because obviously not only is the companionship fabulous, but you are gaining new knowledge and you can take that knowledge. And one thing you're really great about honey is, is you're not just gaining the knowledge, but then how am I going to implement it? You're able to take that stuff and it get back to your program and better the program. But, um, but it's just changing the mindset that it is important and you, and you need to go. So talk to all the shy people who are hiding in the back, who are afraid, who feel like I'm not worthy enough to be in that room or everyone who's in that room is smarter than me or better than me or more ahead of me or all the things more than me. What do you want to tell that person? Um, so I don't know that you know this story, honey, but um, when I first started at my facility, I was a pre I was the pre-K teacher and I, I literally would not order a pizza because I thought I sounded stupid on the phone. I was just, I just didn't, branching out was just not something I did. Unless I knew you, I wasn't going to talk to you. And then now here I am a, you know, a business owner, talking on a podcast, you know, all of those things. But it's because I I forced myself to step out of that comfort zone. I forced myself to allow myself to grow. And that's what it comes down to is I, I put that importance there on what that means to grow. And it's, it's extremely important to not only grow your business, but grow yourself because your business can't grow unless you grow. And for me, that meant stepping out and doing that 
uncomfortable situation, whatever that happens to be and, and doing it. Um, and then with each time I did it, I got better and better and more confident doing it. But it's, it's those little steps, that first little step that you do making the phone call for the pizza, um, or calling the parent that, you know, you're, you're uncomfortable calling. Um, and then the next thing you know, you're, you know, you're going to a conference where you don't know anybody and you're opening a, a new opportunity for yourself to really grow and meet new people. I love that you took a bet on yourself, which is ultimately what you're sharing, right? Like you believe that you deserve to bet on yourself and that taking that bet is going to pay off because you're going to do the work. Kathy, any, not so much tips or tricks, but what is an ordinary moment that you embrace in your center every day that can maybe inspire someone who's sitting here and listening? When I get really wrapped up in the paperwork and, and all of that, I really like to, to get up from my desk. Well, I like to get up from my desk anyway, because <laughs> I have a hard time sitting there. Um, but I love to get up from my desk and go to the classrooms and interact with the teachers, interact with the children. Uh, even if that interaction is just going to the teacher and say, hey, I'm here. If you need anything, do you need to go to the restroom? Um, and so I really like to be able to be there for them in that moment. Uh, or if it's just, it's a crazy time and they're trying to get lunch passed out, I like to go in and and help pour the milk. So I, I like to do this, the smaller things that may just mean something important to them, just kind of a little bit of a break or just seeing if my admin team needs anything or I'm a people person. So anything I can do to, to interact with them really makes a difference in my day. I love that. I love that. Kathy, thanks for pushing yourself to be on the show here today. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, the courage to speak up and share the messiness and the wins and everything that comes along with it. Um, I appreciate you. I appreciate our relationship and I'm excited to see you in person again real soon. Yes.